he is the greatest Vaishnava, as we all know. So why would he actually um, preach something which is uh, totally away from... He was ordered to. He's ordered to by the Lord Himself. The Lord Himself came as Buddha. And uh, Buddha is teaching to atheists. Not that, not that, you see, don't look at it this way, that Buddha Dev and Shankarjai came to introduce something. The atheism was already there. The atheistic attitude was there. So they came to preach to people who were atheists uh, to get them on some kind of path of regulation to benefit them. The, at the time Buddha Dev appeared, uh, what were the Brahmins doing? They, they, they were, it's Kali Yuga already, but they're slaughtering animals in the name of sacrifice. In Kali Yuga, animal sacrifice is forbidden because Brahmins do not have the power to benefit the souls of the animals that uh, lose their lives in sacrifices. By mantra and these great Karmakanda Yagyas, the Brahmins uh, would elevate the souls of the sacrificed animals to heaven, to Svargalok. Uh, and they would demonstrate that they had power over <coughs> the souls by sometimes, Prabhupada says, as a kind of experiment, a scientific experiment, you know, demonstration, they would sometimes bring the animal back to life after it was sacrificed. They would chant mantras and the animal's body would again become not, on, not only whole again, but rejuvenated. The, the, they would use an old animal and then it would be sacrificed and then by mantra they would bring the animal back to life in a young body just to show everyone that this we're not killing animals. This is not slaughterhouse business here. This is sacrifice. You see, so people would have faith because of seeing the power of such brahmanas. But in the Kali Yuga, there are no such Brahmins. So therefore, sacrifice is forbidden. In fact, Madhvacharya, uh, who founded the Brahma Sampradaya in Kali Yuga, uh, he, was, he was very uh, Vedic, you see. He, he, he was preaching to Br South Indian Brahmanas. And South Indian Brahmanas are very, very Vedic. So he allowed for these sacrificial rituals to go on. But he said, when it comes to the part of sacrificing the animal, then uh, you, you have an animal, model of an animal made from dough, from, you know, from uh, flour and water. And then you can cut the head of that. <laughs> because you, Brahmins today have no power to, uh, to determine by mantra the fate of the soul of such a creature. So just, the Veda says, animal must be sacrificed. So you sacrifice an uh, animal made of dough. So, uh, so anyway, these brahmanas at the time of Buddha Dev, they were just killing animals uh, without this power to benefit them. So turning Vedic sacrifice into slaughterhouse. So therefore, Buddha Dev came to say, "Stop this." He preached to them uh, because they would say, "But the Vedas say we should do this," and he, he would say. Uh, never mind the Vedas. They're just creations of man. Why you follow them? Because they had no brain to understand anything. So he just told them, the uh, Vedas are just empty words. Never mind. And he told them to... Basically, Buddhism means four regulative principles. He told them to follow the four regulative principles and to meditate. He didn't really say to meditate on what. <laughs> this is a process of negation negating this world, uh, achieving nirvana, which is just some yes. vague state of freedom from suffering, not very clearly defined in Buddhism what it is. In fact, they say you can't say what it is. <coughs> so, uh, so in this way, they were atheists, but he put them uh, on a path that for atheists is auspicious, getting them to to accept regulation. And then Sankaracharya came later, later to preach to these Buddhists. <laughs> he came to preach to the Buddhists and to turn them into Vedantists in person. So he had to build a bridge to Vedanta 
from their Buddhistic Shunyavad to this Advaita Vedanta, this impersonal, all is one Vedanta, because uh, that they could conceive of, like they could conceive of some uh, state which in many ways is the same as their conception of Shunya. There's no name, no form, no activity, but there is at least Sat, eternal existence, whereas in the Buddhist Shunyavad even that is not there. So think of it that way, his contribution, uh, the contribution he made preaching to the people that he had to preach to. Therefore we don't have to preach to them now. <laughs> Anything else? Yes, of course you have a question. Uh, just that uh, this word Santa, and now we are in Christmas mode, has it got anything to do with the Santa Claus? <laughs> 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 Is there any connection? Or <laughs> yeah, there is a connection. There is a connection. <laughs> yeah, because How Santa you means saint also. <laughs> but Santa Claus was never in the Christ, I mean, in Christ. No, never, sa is, yes, never sa the Santa no. is actually <coughs> never in the Santa Claus or Saint <coughs> Nicholas is originally some pagan you know, European pre-Christian entity of some kind or other who, who uh, <laughs> gave. Get, he, he said to you know I was uh, a few months ago in Finland, and the Finns believe that the original Saint Nicholas comes from their country and they even have like a holy place. <laughs> <laughs> they have a commercial Santa Claus village where the typical, you know, American Santa Claus with a big beard and red suit. But then they have another place way out in the woods somewhere where they, the Finns know about only them and they were the original and this Nicholas came from and he was some kind of uh, yeah, forest wizard or something like that. <laughs> and uh, there are many, many old stories, some old stories about him. And then, you know, the Christianity uh, incorporated so much of, because the Christianity itself, they don't know. They don't know when Jesus Christ was born. They do not know when he was born. Hmm. This, um, this Christmas festival is, is simply uh, assigned to the date of the um, solstice. You know, solstice means the, the days get shorter, 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 and then on the day when they start to get longer, longer, longer. So that falls in, in December. Uh, now they calculate, I think, around the 22nd of December. So the, in, in Rome, in ancient Rome, the 25th that day was the day of the change of solstice. And this was a great pagan festival. So the Christians just wanted to, uh, uh, you know, take over the European culture. So they just plugged Jesus Christ's appearance day into <laughs> the, that, that pre-existing festival, religious festival, the change of the solstice, and Easter, which is uh, the day <coughs> of Christ's uh, coming out of the the tomb that he was placed in. Uh, this is, uh, they don't know what day that was either, but there was a goddess Ostara that was worshipped on that day, so they just plugged Easter you know, <laughs> into that day, and that's why it still has the name Easter. The name Easter comes from the name of this goddess Ostara. It has nothing to do with Christianity at all. And so, interesting, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> That's why it's called the Roman Catholic Church. <laughs> because the background is Roman paganism. <laughs> yes? Yeah, this is a very gentle question regarding Jesus Christ. There's a lot uh, written about Jesus Christ in the Bausha Purana. The yes. They uh, actually had come to India. And yes. And even I think there's a reference to Muhammad. Yes, there is. Part of the yes. So how does this relate to the thing? Because actually they relate say... To what? I mean, they say if Jesus Christ died in the cross and he never came to India, according to that tradition, I mean, European. 
they don't know. <laughs> there is this period of Christ's life after he was about 13 years old till the time he started preaching. And they don't know what he did. There's no record. So they, you know, they, because they want to maintain their orthodox doctrine, therefore they say, no, he didn't come to any, but they don't know what he did. So in the Bhavishya Purana it says in that time of his youth he came to India and he learned. He took, uh, he became disciple of a uh, spiritual master in India, someone, we don't know who. He, in Bhavishya Purana he's called Isa. Isa. And uh, then he went back and he preached. And uh, and then afterwards he returned to India. So what they know is, they do know that Jesus Christ, he was crucified, he was put in the grave, and then a few days later he came out. Because he was a great yogi. And, uh, and then he was moving around. They say he was moving around for at least 40 days. That's the traditional... Uh, Orthodox Christian belief that for 40 days he was moving among his disciples in a very mysterious way. Sometimes visible, sometimes invisible. Mystic powers. Yeah, mystic powers. And then they say he ascended into heaven. But Bhavisha Purana says he went back to India. So compared to Palestine of those days, India was heaven. <laughs> hey, they're hanging people on cross and things like that. <laughs> so India was heaven. <laughs> yes. Kumar, I heard that he went. He came to India and he studied in Nalanda University. Well, that's <laughs> some esoteric people say that. Some esoteric people say that. You see, that's <laughs> some people say that. Then in Pakistan, they have they have some place where yeah. Jesus Christ's tomb, and they they say he got married, and mm -hmm. there's a family that is descended from Jesus Christ. So that's another story of Jesus. <laughs> and, and the Tibetan Buddhists say he was a Buddhist, and the, you know. So. <laughs> and the Mormons said that he went to America after that. Oh, the woman said. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the Japanese say he went to Japan. <laughs> That's true also. I don't just remember. There's some Japanese that say he went to Japan, so, you know. But I heard uh, that there is no bona fide uh, version of uh, this uh, Quran. You heard from who? Good Quran, Hana, he said. Well, I heard from Prabhupada that it is bona fide. It's bona fide. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> it's, r it's right in the database. It's not only just heard, it's written. Prabhupada said it to Tamil Krishna Maharaj. Whatever there is correct, he said. Whatever is in that Purana is correct. That's what Prabhupada said. I've told this to Gopi Janapala I don't know. Yeah? Uh, Shilasanathan Goswami, he wrote his famous Bihabhavata Amrita. And it's pretty much about chanting and smiling. Why he's not mentioning that Mahamantra? Yeah. Why don't you ask him? Why do you ask me? Why do you even think of it? You see, I, I don't feel like I have to answer these kinds of questions. Is that there's, there's a problem I see. You know, I don't know. I don't want to talk about it. I just don't know why devotees have to pull questions out of the air like this. I mean, do you stay up at night thinking about them? <laughs> no, I, I read this book and it's uh, a lot about Gopal Mantra and different mantras. But uh, it's a big book and... Uh, and so what is your conclusion? The Hare Krishna Mantra isn't no, there. I'm just what, so what do you conclude? Why he's not uh, well, mentioned? Why? Today. Why do you wonder about that? Why don't you ask Krishna why he didn't put the Hare Krishna mantra in the Bhagavad Gita? Huh? Yeah, this yeah. book is about uh, Vrindavan and Tam. And, uh, well, Krishna, the Bhagavad Gita is about Krishna. It's a different mood. Different, different mood. mood, mood yeah. huh? Okay, well, these things you know best yourself. <laughs> I don't even know what you're talking about now. You've got this all worked out in your mind, something about different moods and this and that. Makes no sense to me, I'm sorry. You're going to have to work this out yourself with someone else. 
But I really don't see the necessity of inquiring like this. Why Hare Krishna mantra isn't, you know, uh, it's not actually even in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. Did you know that? How about that? Lord Chaitanya. Wow, you're going to have to go home and hit <laughs> your head against the wall about these things. my next question. Huh? It will be my next question. Not to me. Not to me. Ask someone else. Go home and hit your head against the wall all night about this. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Anything else? <coughs> You're from Russia, right? No. Where are you from? The some other country. In the CIS. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They all <laughs> ask questions like this there. That's why I don't like to go there. <laughs> 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 uh, last time I went there I said there must be a factory here somewhere. <laughs> they just churn out these kind of questions. Not everyone worries about these things. You see. I'm not worried. <laughs> uh, asking, it's, it's not. Yeah, but you shouldn't. If you're not worried, then don't ask. And if you are worried, then you should ask your guru. Yes. Raja, this uh, your fire sacrifice and this amazing deity worship. Would you like to give us some advice to do? little more into it, like how to do it properly next year, like well, tomorrow's yeah. seminar, like will you explain a little more how to do it? But did you worship in the seminar on the Hare Krishna mantra? I don't think so. <laughs> no, like your fire sacrifice things, uh, we like to learn a little, okay. like Padma Sambhava Prabhu, and uh, his I'm going to do this fire sacrifice on the last day. Okay. Again. So tomorrow we'll just chant the Kali Sutra and Upanishad together. <coughs> like we did today. And then, then uh, on Monday we'll, without me chanting first, we'll all just chant it together. And do that the fourth day also. And this way we try to learn how it goes. <coughs> and we'll conclude the last session with another sacrifice. Okay then. Thank you.